Okay, now we're going to continue, but we're also going to shift into a new direction. Again, this is Matthew 24, 25 at the top. You've seen now in some detail that these syllable counts, which I've not fully explained yet, even though I've done so many videos, these syllable counts are deliberate, okay? And that Luke is aware of them, and he's playing to repackage. Remember from part two? He's repackaging at 112, which is the number of days distant from first day of Passover to Tishbaav. He's packaging to poignantly stop prophetically at the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which will result in um, the temple being raised due to false Christs. I mean, the temple has been, been raised in 70 AD, but the whole town gets raised and a pig temple goes on top. Okay, because everybody is violating this. They are deceived. Alright, versus Christ who was linking that same text, because he says it first, Luke is quoting him, to the Christians being false Christs, specifically in Rome and specifically the so-called apostolic fathers. Okay, which brings about the crisis of the third century and the expulsion of Christians from Rome. Alright, so there's a parallel going on here. It's real obvious that Luke is counting the syllables. It's real obvious that the Lord is counting the syllables. And you should have gotten that far by now in saying, oh, okay, this is not something brain out's inventing. It's not, it, this isn't about whether I'm inventing it or not so much as, look, it's deliberate uh, technique in scripture. And this goes all the way back to Genesis 1, which hopefully you've seen the videos on that by now. So the question is, as I left it in the last increment, well, where does Paul come in? All right, and I'm still not sure I can answer that question, except to say that Paul is definitely playing on the same material, and he appears to be playing on it from Luke, because see here, look, here's Paul. Okay, in Luke, let me go back, 112, you add 30, just like you add 30 to this to get the ADs, okay? So here's 70 AD when the temple goes down, 40 years after Christ talks. The 70 is a 49, which is playing back to the first temple, going down and then getting rebuilt after 49 years in diaspora, and that is obviously being picked up on by Luke down here using the same 49. He's expecting you to know the meter in Matthew or his his writ, his wit isn't going to make any sense. Okay, well, Paul's doing the same thing because Paul, and I, I, you know, I just started it this way. I didn't realize that this was as deliberate as it is. But Paul is starting at verse 3 as if it were a new um, meter. And that, this Yulogetas Hoteos Kaipater, it's, it's, it's a, a marching song, actually, which I didn't know at the time I did it. Um, you can see that what he's doing, he's starting at year 1 A.D., and by the time you get here, at the end of Kuryu, that's 14 A.D., when Augustus was deified. So the satire that we saw in Matthew, because I didn't know Matthew at the time I did Luke, um, Paul, is being continued by Luke and is being continued by Paul. The question is, is Paul playing on Luke or is Paul playing on Matthew? And I don't know. It looks like he's playing on Matthew. And the reason why I say that is we get down here, see, um, 112 in Luke, add to 30 AD, is 142. Okay, in Paul, it's syllable equals year AD. 142, which, you know, if you if he's operating on a different fiscal, you'd still call it 141, because Israel had two fiscals, one beginning at the autumnal equinox and the other one beginning at the sacred, and I'm not sure which, which um, fiscal year Paul is using, but that's why he might end it at 141 rather than 142, okay? Luke appears to be using... Um, well, I'm not really sure. In Luke, in Luke 1.26 and 36, Luke 1.26 is using the sacred year. And then when Gabriel talks to Mary, he's using the civil year. And that's how come, you know, Christ is born six months after John. 
is making a play on the two calendars there. And Gabriel expects Mary to know that joke. Alright, so is Luke using the civil calendar or is he using the sacred calendar? Whichever one he's using, Paul could be using the one prior, which would de tend to be the sacred. Because the sacred year starts after, you know, because the sacred year starts on Passover, which is technically speaking the seventh month of the civil calendar. So Paul could be numbering this from the sacred calendar. Since Christ dies on Passover, he might be numbering it based on that. I don't really know. Okay. But you'll notice that it's a, you know, it, it's an obvious reference. Now look at what the text says. Es Now how can you say to yourself, we've been graced out due to a pig temple standing on top of where the real temple used to be. And as I tried to explain in, in uh, part two of this series between Matthew and Luke, is that that produced the diaspora. See, that's what 49 means, is diaspora. That produces a diaspora. And as a result of diaspora, it's a blessing to all the people who are going to be the recipients of, as it were, the refugees from this. Because the refugees are going to take the Bible with them. And so, Paul is sort of chiming in, as it were, a third voice, saying, you know, when you see this pig temple standing on top of, all right, and you're not allowed to be back into the land, you're, you're supposed to be thinking, we've been graced out. And that's really the theme of what he's saying all along. You know, Christ is born, ulogetes hoteos kai pater. Yeah, see, father becomes father, as it were of the humanity of Christ when Christ is born. So these are the first 10 years of Christ's life. Then he's age 20, he's age 27, and then very cleverly at age 33 he dies here and pas u. And pas u lo. See, because he's the word ha ha. And pas u lo. This is 27, 28, 29, 30, wait a minute, 31, 32, which is the E, and the I is 33, so in Pasulogia, yeah, he himself is every spiritual blessing, that's why we get the blessing we get, ha ha ha, he dies at 33. Now, there's more to say about this, because Paul is actually playing on two calendars in Roman terms as well, that were then extant when Paul writes. It was the official viral calendar which um, Claudius had made law in 41 AD. But before that, and the better, the more apt calendar, the correct one, was made by Livy. And that was back during the time of Augustus. They were debating both calendars. Livy said the Abor Becondita in what we would call 1 AD was 750. Varro padded four extra years back in the 300s BC so said that Abur Becondita in the year that we call 1 AD is 753 we're using the Abur Becondita Avaro and so were they because it was law to use it so Paul is making a play on how Christ loses three years because of Avaro here and I've been making videos on that in my Patu playlist, but they're not all, the, 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 I haven't really done a good job of those videos yet, but I will. The point is, is that Paul is making, this, all this is, is, you're supposed to regard this as 1 AD. But for them, if Abur Bekondita is 750, then 33 AD is what they're using here. We can't do that because all of our Roman scholars use the Varro calendar, not the Livy calendar. So in order to keep your numbers to agree with the you know common data that you find, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to say Christ died 30 A.D. as if he were only 30 rather than 33. Okay. And Paul is playing with that because they had the same problem we do. Even so, look at the wit, all right? 33, 
He's every good, every spiritual, he's every blessing. See, this is pasulogia means every blessing. Numatike is spiritual. Okay, but the Lord himself is just blessing incarnate. All right. So that's the kind of wit that Paul is bringing to the table is, hi, here you're going through this history, all right, and you're going to be looking at this future history, first Matthew and then Luke's, you know, adaptation of it to show cause and parallelism. And Paul's saying, what are you supposed to think about that? Okay, well, think about that, what I'm saying here, beginning at Christ's birth, all right? With the with the satire against the Roman Empire, satire against human anything, also running through it because Curio is 14 A.D. when our boy Augustus dies. That's how clever this is. Okay, again using Varro. All right. So if you were using Varro and you were playing with this, and it'd be three syllables: N, one, two, pas, u. If you're using Livy, which is the correct one, you get all the way to the end of the word. Okay? But you would still but it would still be the equivalent of fourteen AD for Augustus because the error er, error that Varro made is in the three hundreds BC. It's only when you use the total age for Rome as your accounting system that you have to play this game with the extra three. Okay? So just treat this as A.D. the way we do it. All right, and that's what Paul is actually doing. Because when you get here, the telematos here, that's 117 A.D., and that is when Trajan dies. Hadrian takes his place, and every time you got the aid here, the telematos. Some emperor is dying, and the guy who takes his place undoes everything that prior emperor accomplished each time. So it, the satires is in Paul also, just like it is, obviously, here up here in Matthew and here in Luke. All right, so when we get to 142, all right, great, we got this satire, but it's also wry in, an, in a different direction. It's like, yeah, it's a satire on the idea that some kind of um, diaspora, which is technically speaking a punishment a bad time for you to be able to say instead with which grace he has graced us out during those same years that's a satire on bad in other words God makes good on bad ha ha alright that's the idea that Paul is bringing to the table with this text as a commentary as it were on Matthew and Luke but he's not directly saying anything about Matthew or Luke here so the reader who presented this material when he also presented the Luke stuff that was a commentary on Matthew would have explained all that because it's real obvious just from the numbers. So Paul, so instead of saying, oh, we're, you know, under diaspora and oh, we can't go to Jerusalem anymore except on Tish B'Av, which is 112 days after Passover. Instead of crying and moaning about that and bobbing in front of what we call the Wailing Wall, you say, oh, we've been graced out. Yeah, and the people who receive those refugees will be saying that too. Because this is how they end up getting scripture. The people, the refugees leave Jerusalem, go to other parts. And the parts that they go to end up, as it were, getting the arrival of Christ. Christ coming to them. See, parousias. Christ arrives to you through his word. And the whole theme of this thing is what is the what are the signs of your arrival? See Samayan sign of your arrival, parousia. Very pregnant word in Greek Orthodox. Alright? This whole thing, this whole pair of chapters in Matthew has key words, I'm in Lego Homin being one of them which is a, technically speaking an anaphora and then there's another anaphora about parousia which I'm counting at four syllables it might be three to show the theme of the chapter the arrival of Christ 
See, here he's arrived, because he's actually talking. Believe it when I tell you. That's one arrival, you know, metaphor. Okay, another arrival is when he uses the term parousia, which he first uses here in their question of the signs. And then the next time he uses it is in Matthew 24, 42, which is all the way down here. See? Well, it's a, it's a synonym for it. Erketai. Um, but he first used it right. Yeah, up here. Sorry. Verse 27. Parousia. See? This is the first time he uses it after verse 3. Well, what's this? Well, I've covered this before in the videos in the earlier series, but this is, stands for 863 A.D. This was the year that the Moravian uh, the area was taken over by Louis the German, and he ordered that they be Christianized. So there were two guys named Cyril and Methodius, you can look this all up on the Internet, who invented a Moravian alphabet so that they could translate the Bible into Moravian and it's because of this happening when it does that Russia which was just being founded at that time gets scripture that's pretty important the whole northern continent uh, you know the side opposite the US we hadn't gotten it yet that's pretty important development that's the parousia the arrival of the son of man through his word the word here I am. I'm actually physically present now and I'm talking. Believe it when I tell you. You see? And so they're saying, well, what are the signs if you're coming? Well, that that's a word play on the word coming. How does God come to you? Well, number six tells you that he comes to you through the word. He came to visit Moses. And as a result of Moses seeing God face to face, he had to wear a veil. So when you, you see God face to face, when you see his word, any Jew will tell you that. Okay, we'll see, here's the play on it. And the, that parousia in verse 27 is the first instance, there are three of them. It's the first instance of what is called in Greek an anaphora, which means a repeated phrase. And here's the anaphora, parousia tu huio tu antropo, the appearance of the Son of Man. And how does he appear to you? through his word. And how did he appear through his word? To the Moravians through an alphabet that was created specifically so that they could get the Bible in their own language. And it just so happened that that Cyrillic alphabet created was what the Russians needed that were really Vikings from the north. What they needed in order for them to get Bible too. And that's how all of Russia got converted, which really mattered because in this particular year Russia was, had just finished invading Byzantium and therefore had a whole bunch of Greek manuscripts of the Bible that they didn't appreciate, but it was, you know, on rich paper, actually vellum. And so they, they took it as plunder back home, but they didn't know what it said. But Cyrus and Methodius would know what it said because they could read the Greek. You see how important all this is? It's a confluence of events of the appearance of of the Son of Man. And then of course Cyrus and Methodius would be nonplussed because here they're getting manuscripts they always wanted. They came from Byzantium in a raid by Russians who for the first time are hearing about this Bible so that they know what it was that they plundered. You see, this is hysterically funny and it's witty and it's ironic and it's satirical. Here you stole something you didn't value. Okay, well this something that you stole that you didn't value happens to be me. So now I'm a coming to you. You stole me, I'm coming to you. You didn't know what you stole. Now you're going to find out. And that was real important because 200 years later, these same Russians were going to be busy helping the Byzantines defend Jerusalem against the Arabs. But if they hadn't been evangelized first, they wouldn't be interested in doing that. You get the point? See, this is hysterical. Paul does not go that far in the timeline. Luke does. Luke is covering a bit differently. See, instead of 833, he's got 820 to 840. And you notice 
instead of 833 he's got 847 years later and he calls it a 91 which is a good number that means God's purpose got accomplished and now it's time for tribulation Christ was supposed to be 91 years old when the tribulation was supposed to begin had there been no church so it's a real important number and Paul uses 91 throughout see look here's the spring that's the first 91 and then he goes on and he creates the summer that's the second 91 in Ephesians and then at summers when you have wartime and so this is why he puts verse 10 separate on its own as a 14 I'm not explaining all those numbers because I've explained them so many times before so here's here's the, the fall 91 and then the last 91 doesn't have any sub sevens and that's the end of Ephesians 1 14 see the 91 there so he's definitely playing but for the first 400 years versus Paul, uh, Luke. Now is Luke playing on Paul or is Paul playing on Luke? Because Luke, Luke goes all the way to, see, the first 1050 after, after the millennium was supposed to start. So is he playing on Paul or Paul playing on Luke? I'm assuming Paul's playing on Luke. And just doing it for a shorter period because Paul finishes this is 434 this is 62 weeks ha ha well, Ephesians 1 and 2 are 56 syllables so that sum is actually 490 but Paul is stopping here because um, in 434 AD that's when both Rome's end up getting ransomed to the to the um, barbarians they have to pay huge amounts of money to avoid being sacked both Rome's both the Western Rome and Byzantium have to pay huge sums and the reason why that matters is that in the previous 56 syllables that Paul uses in Ephesians 1 1 and 2 is he's stating it back to Crassus when Crassus came to Jerusalem and basically ransomed it and said hi give me your money or I'll sack your town that's exactly what would end up happening in 434 AD and you're supposed to praise his glory for that. See, it's satirical. Anyway, I've thrown a lot of information at you quickly. So I'm going to let you play with it. You're going to want to, you know, look at these documents and, and think through and talk to God. Use one John 1 I when you do to make it easier. And um, see for yourself just how remarkable it is. And then in the next increment, we're going to go through more of this. How do you trace what the Lord is saying is the theme for if he, for Matthew 24, 25. We know that it's, I'm in Lego Humin, I'm here. And then they ask him the question, what's the sign of your coming? And so one of the key phrases he's going to use to answer that question is going to be about the sign of his coming, which is right here, parousia. And that's repeated three times, and every single time the distance in the syllable counts is sevenable. It's divisible by seven every time. And when Luke does it, because he uses the same phrase, see, huio tu antropo, the distance between his syllable counts, referring to his, what he says using the same term, and the distance between his syllable count and what, Paul, and what Matthew packages here, is always divisible by seven so that's how you know what the themes are and that's how you know again syllable counting is a deliberate style in the Bible and it reveals in you know interpretation that we didn't even think of before specifically about the future peace out